God preserves life. You with me? All right. Let's pray and get ready for God's word this morning. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that you desire to speak to us. You desire to give us fresh revelation. You desire to give us fresh understanding of who you are. But not only that, you desire to transform us and to change us as we engage your word. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. We invite you to come and move among us. We, desire, we invite you to change our hearts, to transform our minds, and help us to become more like Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so last Sunday morning we launched our series for January. Um, this series is called Healthy. Um, Jesus gave us two commandments that he said pretty much embodied all of the law. He said that we are to love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And we are also to love our neighbors as ourselves. But the first and greatest commandment of all is to love God with everything that we are. Well, in order for us to love God with everything that we are, we need to be healthy in each one of those areas. So last Sunday morning, we started off by talking about how we can have a healthy heart. And heart meaning how we can be healthy in our emotions and in our desires. This Sunday, we're going to be looking at the soul. How we can have a healthy soul. Today, God wants to restore your soul. He wants you to walk out of this place uplifted and encouraged and knowing how much he loves you and how much he desires to fulfill his plans for you. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says, Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. Now some translations say creature. Um, the actual Hebrew there means the word soul. So when God created the first human being named Adam, he took the different parts of the earth or the different elements, he took dirt and he formed them into a human shape. And then he breathed or what another word, the Hebrew word actually means he placed his spirit into the man and the man became a living soul. So here we actually have the three parts of, of what a human being consists of. Every human being consists of a physical body, a spirit that comes from God, and also a soul. The soul is the part of the human being that makes up the person's identity. So when we talk about your soul, we're talking about your identity or your personality. Your soul is who you are. Your soul is your self-awareness, and your soul is also your God. Awareness. This is what sets us apart from animals. All right? Animals do not have a self awareness on the level that we do. Animals are instinctual. Now, I know you're thinking your fluffy has a soul. <laughs> your fluffy is completely self aware, knows that God created him, and worships on Sunday with you while you're gone at church. All right? That may be true. God did talk through a donkey one time. Maybe you have a talking donkey at home. I don't know. But the thing that sets humanity apart from the animal world is this self-awareness and this God-awareness. Yes, animals have personality, but we have a personality that's based on something much more intricate, much more God-given. Because God breathed his soul, or sorry, God breathed his spirit into humanity. He did not do that for animals. So we have a physical body, a God-given spirit, and we also have a soul, which is the foundation of who we are. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 27, it says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what, would it. for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? On what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of the Father. And then he will repay each person according to what he has done. You know, we actually have an expression in our culture, and it goes something like, um, you know, we'll say, well, he really sold his soul 
for this or for that. But you know the Bible says that you can actually do that? You can actually sell out your soul? You can actually sell out your identity? You can actually sell out who God created you to be. You can actually sell out this person that God made you to be in order to have something else or in order to be something else. You know, right now, um, in the, I'm not even going to try to use relevant terminology because I'm going to make a fool out of myself. Um, in the hip hop world, in the world of rap, people like, I know some of you are like, rap? Like, Christmas presents? What are we talking about? In the world of rap, you know, there's some, there's some people out there. I'm just going to give you names that I hear about on the radio. I do not listen to these people, mainly because I cannot understand anything that they say. Um, people like Kanye West. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right, that's the only one I know. So, uh, <laughs> all right, that's pretty much it for me. And that's a good thing. Well, right now, and I, did, I read an article about this recently. It was really interesting. A lot of these young um, hip-hop artists are actually intentionally and very vocal about the fact that they are selling their souls to Satan. And this isn't just like, hey, this isn't one of those Christian, hey, let's ban this because we've made something up in our heads. No, this is real. Like, they talk about this. And they put it into their album covers, and they actually will, um, the, the article I read said that they're actually putting these things into their music videos. And there's really a focus right now in the hip-hop world amongst these young artists of worshiping Satan. And they're all about the Illuminati, and they're all about um, this enlightenment, they're all about all this demonic worship. And they, they bring in these demonic figures into their, their music videos, and, they, and on their album covers, and in their conversations. And they actually use all of these different signs, and, and they do these different things. And, it, and they're literally, they're very serious about this. You know, a couple of years ago, I don't know if you've heard of Beyonce. Um, all the single ladies, right? Okay, you probably heard it. Anyway, Beyonce had a con was in an interview confessed that when she goes on stage, she's actually possessed by a demon and performs. Like, this was from her own mouth. Like, this isn't just Pastor Tanner saying, don't listen, it's all demonic. No, this is real. Like, this is what they're saying, and this is what they're promoting, and this is what they're encouraging other young people to do. Sell your soul to the devil, and you'll have everything that you could ever imagine. Well, you know who else said that? The devil. You know, one time Jesus, Jesus went up on a mountain and Satan was there with him and he said, if all you, all you have to do is worship me and I'll give you everything. This has always been Satan's MO. If you will sell your soul, you can have everything. Thousands of years before that in the Garden of Eden, the first two human beings, and he said to them, if you will only sell your soul for this apple, you can have, I don't know if it was an apple, maybe it was a kumquat, I don't know. If you will sell your soul, if you will take part of this fruit that God has told you not to, you will be like God. All you have to do is sell your soul. All you have to do is give up who you are and you can have everything. This has always been Satan's MO. This has always been Satan's tactic, his greatest lie. He seeks to get us to give up who we are, what we believe in, what we were created for in order to pursue something else. But the problem is, is that the things that he offers us will never bring us life. They will always take our lives in the end. So Jesus said, if you want to come after me, you need to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Now what he means by this is he's not telling us that we're not supposed to be who we are. You have your personality. You have your disposition. You are who you are because God created you to be who you are. Your personality comes from God. God has a personality. Jesus has a personality. The Holy Spirit has a personality. You are made in God's image. You have a personality because God has a personality. And our personalities and our differences are something to be celebrated. I don't want to hang out with me all the time. I get tired of me very quickly. In fact, I don't surround myself with people that are like me because I want to experience a variety. Even in the Trinity, there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's three distinct personalities within the one Godhead. 
Even God himself enjoys variety within himself. Personality, differences in personality is a good thing. God created you to be something wonderful. God created you to be somebody wonderful. And he wants you to live out to that potential. But what he says here is that in order for us to follow him, to be able to become that person, to become fully realized into the person that he created us to be, then we need to let go of who the world is trying to create in us. You see, the enemy also has a design for us. The world also has a design for us. You know who the world wants us to become like? The world. Satan wants us to become like him. God wants us to become like him. So there's this battle. And Jesus says in order for us to fully become the people that God created us to be, then we need to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. And then he follows it up with this. Because what is your soul worth? Is there anything? When you sit down and you really think about it, is there anything that you would give in exchange for your soul? You know, I think about the young hip-hop artists that are doing this, that are making these deals with the devil. And they actually have these, these, these ceremonies where they actually give their soul over. And they will actually write up like documents and say, this now belongs to Satan. And you know what? They're having all kinds of fame. And I personally believe that Satan's behind some of it. He's opening up some doors for them. But the thing that they don't realize is how long do they get to enjoy the fame? How long do they get to enjoy the fruits of this? 10 years? 20 years? What if they get to enjoy it until their last breath? And let's say they live a long life. Let's say they live 110 years on this earth. What happens after that? Maybe 110 years of living now everything that they desire to have right now. But what's eternity have for them? Eternity to compare it to 110 years is nothing. It's like a drop of water in the midst of an ocean, in the midst of an ocean, in the midst of an ocean, in the midst of an ocean that goes on forever. God tells us, don't buy into the lie that the here and now is all that there is. Don't buy into the lie that right now, getting what you want right now is going to make you happy. Because what you get right now, that's all you're going to get. And it's going to run out eventually. I actually want to show you a, a video clip. Three video clips that illustrate this, I think, really great. Um, it's kind of a funny video clip, so I hope that you'll enjoy it. Um, I really enjoy the main actor in this clip. Um, so the first one is to me a very good illustration of what we will do with the life that God offers us. Would you please play it? Here you go. See you later, Chloe. <laughs> All right? Isn't that true? God offers us something good. God offers us something for our good. God offers us something to take care of us. God takes care of us. And what do we do with it? <laughs> Not what I wanted today. I didn't want dry, I wanted wet. I, I, didn't want, I didn't want a burger, I wanted steak. I don't want a Corolla, I want a Maserati. I don't, you know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna be an assistant manager, I wanna be a CEO. I don't want a blonde, I want a brunette, whatever. <laughs> whatever God gives us, so many times our human nature is simply to go Poof. Well this second video is a great illustration of what happens as we're going through life and our eyes find what they're not supposed to have. Go ahead. and receive and fulfill the great. 
The problem with good is that good expires. Great inspires. God wants a... Yeah, that just came right out from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Somebody write that down. I'll put it on a book, all right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. That was Jesus. But that's the reality of it. God wants us to have great lives. And Satan's like, but you can have all kinds of good. You want the good? I'll give you all the good you can handle. And God, Jesus is saying, deny yourself. Pick up your cross and you can have the great. And this last video clip, I think, does a great job of illustrating the fact of what I just said. Great inspires us, but good always leaves us wanting more. Go ahead. Right? Completely gorged ourselves on everything that life has to offer us. Falling down out of the refrigerator, stuffed beyond our limit. Ooh, cake? <laughs> There's always room for cake. And that's the lie of Satan. There's always life for more good. Because we never run out of our need for it. You see, great will always inspire you to pursue the great things of God. And God will fulfill you. Good will leave you wanting more. It's like eating Chinese food. You go eat Chinese food. You got to go. Some of you are like, yeah. You can eat $25 worth at a $4 Chinese buffet. And two hours later, you're like, and I am hungry. It's all that MSG. I mean, it just runs. You just, your body just craves more because it doesn't satisfy. It doesn't fulfill you. And that's what Jesus is saying. Do not trade off for what the enemy is offering you. If you will deny yourself, pick up your cross and come after me, I will give you the great. And the great will satisfy your soul. In Genesis chapter 12, 10 through 16, it says, Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, which means to spend time, to the, because the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarah, now ladies, pay attention to this. <laughs> Baby, I know that you're beautiful. You are a beautiful woman. But when the Egyptians see you, they're going to say, this is his wife, and they're going to kill me, but they're going to let you live. So just say that you're my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life might be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. For her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And Abram had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male slaves, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. I want you to see what's happening here. Yes, Abram is a patriarch. And to me, this is a shining example that God uses broken people to fulfill his purposes. This is not okay. This is not okay behavior. Abram sold his, sold his soul at his wife's expense. God had blessed Abram with this beautiful woman. But his role as a man, his role as a husband was to be her priest, her protector, and her provider. And because he was looking out for himself, he told her, number one, I went, now it wasn't a lie that she was his sister. This is how Satan always works. He's not going to come at you with a blunt, full out lie, because he knows you're going to pick up on that every time. He's going to come at you with the good instead of with the great. He's going to come at you with a, little bit of a, with a little bit of a lie in the midst of a whole bunch of truth. Because he knows that you'll gobble that up then. You'll take all the truth, but you're going to take the poison along with it. That's how he gets into our minds. A little bit of, a little bit of bad and a whole bunch of good. Because he doesn't want us to get to the great. So Abram comes into Egypt and he says, honey, just tell him that you're my sister. So she goes along with it. But what happens to her? Now, I'm not going to get graphic. I'm not going to put any details out there. But do you know what it means to become someone's wife? 
It means that they treat you like you're, you're their wife. And it doesn't mean that she was in the co kitchen cooking all the time. It doesn't mean she was keeping his house clean. It means that she went into his harem and she became a sexual slave for him. But Abram had it good. Abram got all kinds of stuff out of the result of this deal. He got, he got servants. He got camels. He, Abram was banking at the end of this. But at what cost? How do we know that God's blessing would not have rested upon Abram, maybe even in a greater measure, if Abram would have just been honest? Is God not capable of providing? Who blessed Abram here? Pharaoh blessed Abram for a very bad reason. Guess what? The ends do not justify the means. That's Satan's logic. And the enemy will at times seek to bless us, to confuse us, and to blind us from reality. Because he tries to counterfeit everything that God does. So in this situation, I believe that Abram's God was big enough, that our God is big enough to have blessed Abram maybe tenfold over this blessing if Abram would have simply done what God's word said to do, which is to be honest. If he, would have walked into, if he would have walked into Egypt trusting in the Lord and said, I'm going to trust God to protect our family. And I'm not going to sell out who I am to protect myself and to get more. I believe God would have protected him. And even if there would have been difficulty, God would have brought him through it to a greater degree. Yesterday, I was at the gym and I was on the treadmill and I love being at the gym when nobody else is there because I get to watch the History Channel. Like, normally when I go to the gym, ESPN's on, and I'm like, oh yeah, I love sports, you know, and I'm talking about stuff that I could care less about. I do watch it just so I can have conversations with other guys so I can feel masculine. And I'm always like, I'll throw out like one liner so I can at least act like I know what I'm talking about. Like, yeah, that Tony Romo's having a good year. <laughs> and people look at me like, not. No, I'm sorry. So anyway, I'm at the gym and I'm watching the History Channel and there's this really interesting documentary on the Nazis. And so I learned some things I want to share with you just a little bit because I think it really relates to where we're going. In 1932, Germany was a poor country. They had been devastated by World War I. They were struggling financially. They were struggling as a people to regain their identity. They were looking for hope. So in their elections at the beginning of 1933, they elected a new chancellor. This young, up-and-coming, um, very, very powerful, persuasive speaker who had all kinds of plans and designs to rebuild the German Empire. You may have heard of him, a young man by the name of Adolf Hitler. Hitler was in office for 52 days, and he was the chancellor. There was actually um, a there was actually like a Congress design in, in Germany at this time. Well, at the end of 52 days, a fire happened that completely destroyed the Parliament building. Nobody ever found out who did it, but Hitler blamed his adversaries, his political opponents, and very very soon there were thousands of his political opponents that had been put into prison. Five days later, five days later, he's been, in, he's been the chancellor less than two months. Five days later, Parliament, now that all of his political adversaries are in prison, Parliament votes to make him the dictator of Germany, the Fuhrer, all power, all authority in Adolf Hitler's hands. You know who some of his greatest proponents were? educated Jews. Because Adolf Hitler told them, I will always take care of you. Germany's going to be better, and you are Germans, so if you support me, I will help you. Well then, not very long after that, Hitler turned it. There were less than 1% of Jews in the German Empire. One, less than 1%. And he began to blame all the problems of the of the of the German people on the Jews. Have you ever heard of this concept? The one percenters are the problem? You ever heard this? 
So all the problems of Germany is now the problem of the 1%, the Jewish people. And so now, he starts building these camps. Anytime camps with barbed wire start going up in your country, be nervous about that. Because they're going to give you all kinds of reasons for what they're there. But we saw in Germany what they were really there for. So they started putting Jews into these concentration camps. By the end of 1933, 100,000 Jews were in concentration camps. Less than 10 months after Hitler took power. Over 1,000 thousand of them had been killed right in front of their, their friends and their family members. And they would put out these propaganda films to show how well these Jews were being treated in the prisons. When in reality, these Jews were being starved to death and beaten to death on a daily basis. Now, do you know the percentage of Nazis that were in Germany at this time? Less than 10%. Less than 10% of the population were Nazis. 90% of the people in Germany were completely appalled by what Hitler was doing. But Hitler made a brilliant move. The same day that he was made dictator, he eliminated free expression and the right to assemble. He eliminated the rights of the people to speak their mind and to gather together for a common purpose. Unless he said it was the right thing. He made it illegal to speak out against himself or the empire. And he made it illegal for people to gather together with a purpose of doing something about it. So 90% of the people of Germany kept their mouths shut because they were scared for their own lives. 90% of the population went along with allowing 10% of Germany to eradicate 6 million Jews from the face of the planet. Who sold out? I'm German as it gets. Like my great grandparents straight over from Germany. And they came to America and they were, they were very, they were, they were really brutalized for a long time during the World War II era. Because they were German. And they spoke German. And they lived in German communities. And there was a lot of shame in my family over the, the German heritage because of what Hitler did. So I understand that. But so I can say to you as someone who comes from this heritage that who sold out? Not the 10%. The Nazis believed in what they were doing. It was the 90% who stood by and just allowed it to happen because they did not want to face any dangers or repercussions themselves. And I hear people say all the time, man, our culture is changing fast in America. You know that the people that are changing America the most right now resemble less than 4% of our population? It's really easy to go along with things as long as they're comfortable. And what Adolf Hitler promised the people was comfort. He was going to make Germany great again. He was going to restore Germany's glory. He was going to make Germany the way that it had been. And people loved it. He called for change. Change is coming. And they had an expression, howl with the wolves. Howl with the wolves. In other, law, in other words, go along with what everyone else is doing. And you'll be fine. And during those 10 years, they had economic prosperity. They had, they had the greatest technology in the world. They had the greatest scientists in the world working for them. And the German people went along with everything else that was going on. Because it didn't, it didn't affect them. Hitler was doing all of it everywhere else. He was going everywhere else. It wasn't affecting them on their doorsteps until the war really started coming back. I think that yesterday as I was on the gym, I was thinking, dear Lord, how many areas in my life am I, am I doing nothing about? Am I just sitting by and letting the enemy just do whatever he wants to because it's comfortable, because it's easy. But Jesus said, do not let yourself get caught up in comfort. Deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Because when you do that, you will find your life. God promises us if we seek to save our comfort, we'll lose it. But if we're willing to lose our comfort for his sake, we will find life. And when you find the life of Jesus Christ, you found something worth living for.
When you find the life of Jesus Christ, you found hope and joy and peace and love and the glory of God shining in your life every day. Matthew 10, 28 says, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of your boss. Don't be afraid of your spouse. Don't be afraid of people. Don't be afraid of things. Don't be afraid of circumstances. Because no matter what life brings at you, you have a God who is bigger than all of those things. Your God is greater than all of those things. Do not let anyone or anything push you. Stand firm in who you are in Jesus Christ. Because you are a child of God. Point number one this morning, I'm going to make my points quickly. God wants to restore your soul. Psalm 23, you've heard this many times. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus wants to restore your soul today. And He's made some promises to you. That if you will put your trust in Him instead of in other people, or instead of yourself, or instead of circumstances, if you will put your trust in Him, I've got 18 promises for you this morning from Psalm 23. Number one, Jesus is your shepherd. Number two, Jesus will provide for you. Number three, Jesus gives you rest and plenty. Number four, Jesus will provide your safety and your peace. Number five, Jesus will restore your soul. Number six, Jesus will lead you into righteousness. Number seven, Jesus will be with you during life's difficulties. Next one, Je Jesus says you have nothing to fear. The next one, Jesus says that he is with you. Jesus says that he is your protector. Jesus says he is your comforter. Jesus says he makes you victorious over your enemies. Jesus says he anoints and empowers you. Jesus says that he gives you abundance. Jesus says that you have his goodness. Jesus says that you have his mercy. Jesus says that he is with you every day. And Jesus says that you will spend eternity with him in paradise. I can tell you who you are today. You are intended to be the child of God. And if you have made that declaration, then Jesus says, I will do all of these things in your life if you will let me. And if you are not God's child, you can become his child today. No questions asked, no exclusions. You just have to receive him for who he is. But when we receive Jesus for who he is, Lord and Savior, then he gives us the life that he desires for us to have. Colossians 3.10 says, And put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. This is the good news. It doesn't matter who you were, what you did, where you went. It doesn't matter what happened to you before Jesus. Now, because of Jesus, you have been renewed. So put on the new self. Put on the new self. This week I met with a guy. And uh, we, we met down in my basement. We, we prayed together for about an hour and a half. And before we got into praying, we were just kind of sharing some of our, our goals with each other. And he told me, he said, you know what, Pastor Tanner, I, I really want to be more... Uh, I really want to be more present. I, I don't want to be all the time on my phone and on the internet and on Facebook. I don't want to be so consumed by that stuff. I want to be more present with my family. So he texted me yesterday. You know what he said? 10 a.m., Pastor Tanner, I want you to know I just deleted my Facebook account. It has begun. You know why? Because he has put on the new self. He has put it on. You know, there's a difference between believing and doing. 
You know, Satan believes probably more than any of us in Jesus Christ because he knows him. There's a difference between believing and doing. See, Jesus is calling all of us today to move beyond belief into action. And faith produces action. He wants us to produce faith in us so that we will put our trust in Him because that trust will lead to, to us putting on this new self so that you can be renewed in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Last week I got a Facebook message from a lady. She said, Pastor Tanner, I'm at my end. I'm just a drunk. I've always been a drunk. And I thought about that. And I've reread that message about 20 times. And I texted her yesterday and I said, you know what? I hear what you're saying and I understand where you're at. And I understand why you're feeling this way. But you are not a drunk. You were a drunk. In Jesus, you're not a drunk. In Jesus, you are sober. In Jesus, you are sober for 20 years because he can make you sober for the next 20 years if you will stop trying to do this the same way. How many times do we go around the same mountain over and over and over? And you know what? Jesus says, if we put our faith in him, he moves mountains. But it only happens when we realize that we are new creations. But part of being a new creation means pursuing after him. And not casually pursuing after Him. Going after Him with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. Point number two, you are not a mistake. God did not make a mistake with you. He is not ashamed of you. He does not look at you and say, oh man, I did so good with her brother. Her sister is awesome. What happened? God does not feel that way. Psalm 139, 14 says, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows this very well. Does your soul know this today? Does your soul know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made? Because God has made you. And you know what? He promises that he wants to make you a new creation. So the question that you need to ask today is if you don't feel like if, if the things in your life right now are not fearfully and wonderfully made, then God's not making them. So today you can make a decision and say, I'm done creating my life. I'm done. I'm done being in charge. I'm done going around this mountain. I am done. Making a mess of things. I'm going to let God create me. I'm going to let God make me a new creation. I'm going to let God work in my life. And you know what? So many of us have desired that. So many of us have even said words that have spoken to that. But today, God is calling us to move beyond belief into faith that produces action. To begin to be renewed. And number three, God wants to give you rest for your soul. Because it is exhausting. It is exhausting to try to do it all on your own. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30 says, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke or take my teachings upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, when we try to do it all on our own, Satan just puts more and more and more weight on our shoulders. You know, I just, I'm, I'm just personally, I'll be honest with you, I'm coming out of a season of trying to do everything on my own. And all that produced in me was worry and fear and stress. And I felt like I was carrying the whole world on my shoulders. You ever feel like that? You ever feel like, well, if I don't do it, nobody else is going to. And God's going, I'm still here. <laughs> Did you forget about me? Yep. I forgot about him. God's saying, come to me. Stop trying to do this on your own. I've got a very good friend that I've been talking to the last couple of weeks. I started out in ministry with him. Got a text, or got a Facebook message from his wife last week. He just left her and her two kids. 
called him up, been trying to talk with him, and now he won't even return my calls. And I just want to help him. But I see, I see the place where he has gotten. He's tried for 10 years to do things on his own, in his own power, in his own strength. And this guy is strong. He's physically strong. And now he's so broken, he has no hope. And I'll ask him, what about Jesus? And he'll say, and I can't, I can't turn to him. He doesn't want anything to do with me. I've, I've screwed up too much. Well, the reality for him is that he has screwed up enough that a lot of people don't want anything to do with him anymore. But God never feels that way. God never feels that way about us. And you know why he's gotten to the place where he's at? Because for 10 years he's hidden something. For 10 years, he's hidden a struggle because he's been ashamed, because he's been embarrassed, and because he was afraid of what he might lose. You know what Jesus says? You've got to lose so you can gain. One of the reasons why I try to get up here and be so honest with you about my failings, I know some of it makes you uncomfortable for your pastor to tell you all of his issues. Do you know why I do it all the time? Because I never, ever want any of you to ever feel like you cannot just lay it all out before God. Because you're not going to get any judgment from me. We might, we might just try to up each other on who's more screwed up, but we're not, you're not going to get any judgment from me. And you're not going to get any judgment from anyone here because no one in this room can judge you. Because we've all got our issues. So stop hiding today. Stop hiding from God. Stop hiding from your brothers and sisters in Christ. And find rest to your souls. Would you bow your heads? Right now, God wants to do a work in us. And he's, gonna, he's giving us an opportunity right now to respond to his work. In a couple of moments, we're going to stand and we're going to sing a couple of songs. But during that time, the prayer team is going to be right up here at the front. They're going to come right now. If you need your soul restored today, we want to pray with you. Because that's what God wants to do for you today. He wants to restore your soul. He wants to bring back your hope and your joy. He wants to remind you that you're not a mistake. And he wants you to help you find rest in Him. Or if you need prayer for anything else, we just want to minister to you today. Dear Jesus, help us to get out of our own way today. Help us to deny our flesh and to deny comfort and to deny things that are only good. And help us, Lord, to lose that life so that we can gain the life that you intend for us. So that we can gain your presence. So that we can gain a relationship with you. Because Lord, we know that a relationship with you is the greatest thing that we can ever have. We love you, Lord. Speak to us right now. Move in us right now. In Jesus' name. Would you please stand? I just want to invite you to come and let the Holy Spirit work in your heart this morning.